Our next speaker is our colleague, Dr. Sergio Requenco. Uh, this will be our final formal presentation and so ends the movement east to west from Australia into the far north and now moving into the near deep far south into South America um, okay. from the University of San Marco in Peru, who will talk about some of the rabies issues in Amazonia. Dr. Requenco, you have the floor. Okay, well, uh, good morning, everybody. I'm very grateful to be invited to this talk, uh, this seminar. I can say some more things that might not be mentioned, but I'm very happy to hear that the two, in, the two previous talks have a nice frame for many things I'm gonna say. Uh, I wanna talk today about wildlife rabies, what happened, what would happen after the zero by 30, and especially talking about vampire bat rabies. But first, a uh, very short, small reflection. This is too many words to came to my mind when I want to talk to, to give this kind of talks. And again, um, I also think, uh, can we ever solve these problems? And um, things cannot be changed. But there is a number of situations that we need to consider if we need to approach this rabies in wildlife to make changes. We can do research, but sometimes this research is not translating into policies. If they're not translating into policies, there is no intervention, there is no impact. And to get that, we need to convince people this is worthy to spend our work and time. And this is what we're not trying to do right now. First of all, we have this uh, graphic that Victor del Rio showed us uh, earlier in different way. I want to show you now the last two years of the data from the Pan American Health Organization, Silvera, then we can see how uh, animals biting can produce human cases of rabies. So you can see cases related to dog rabies. In the last decade, they were uh, going down. And, and after the pandemic, it seems to be an, a small increase of um, cases, uh, rabies cases in humans uh, related to dog bites. And then we have vampire bat rabies in the early of the decade it was very high. And then I want to explain what happened. Uh, the cases went down uh, mainly because one sole province in Peru, in the Amazon, uh, has 80% of the human cases of rabies. And when this situation was intervened, there was a very important reduction of the cases that you can see in this group. But then we need to mention cats. There is no feline rabies, but cats are an important intermediate host in, in Latin America. And there are other wildlife like foxes and the sawi monkey in Brazil. And of course, other species of bats that <coughs> might, might be causing human rabies. So it's important to remember then uh, dog rabies is, of course, very important. We discussed the whole morning on that. Solutions for that are not always very helpful for vampire bat rabies. I want to show about that, but we need to think what's going to happen when we control canine rabies, a wildlife rabies emerge. United States is one example. Wildlife rabies is a very important problem for rabies there after they control canine rabies. So this is a different problem that I want people to understand. Uh, you see the countries, I just explained uh, two things to remember in from this picture, again, from data collected by uh, Pan American Health Organization, vampire bat rabies produce most human cases in the, in the region. You have still some dog rabies, but it's in Bolivia. It's not as, as many as before, as I was mentioned already. And then you have all the there are new species coming up, and the cats are here, showing up here. And again, it's an intermediate host, mainly from vampire bats, sometimes from canine rabies too. So yes, human cases in Latin America went down a lot, and I already explained that most of the cases in the last decade were from vampire bat rabies that many people might not be aware. And just a second to mention, when we talk about vampires, we think about the movies of Dracula and things that came from Europe. No, vampire bats are not in Europe. Vampire bats are 
only in Latin America and my live from Mexico to the, to the north of Argentina and that's it and it's only three species. So then we have these uh, interventions that help us to control canine rabies, which is vaccinating the dog, so vaccinating the vector. And um, we don't have a solution to vaccinate bats yet. And there are many issues related to the logistics to do that, but there is some uh, research groups uh, working on vaccines for bumper bats. And we can see in the future what's happening or what will be the impact. But in the meantime, the only intervention was to intervene humans. It means people beaten, as usual, are vaccinated, but not in this case. People not beaten have to be vaccinated because I want to explain how difficult it is to live in the Amazon basin and how difficult it is to access the life-saving vaccination. And this is just a picture just to see Peru, because I'm going to focus a little on Peru, what happened. And then rabies, this is human cases, went down, but vampire bat rabies went, were emerging a lot in the last 20 years. And you can read about this graphic in a already published book on rabies and rabies vaccines, published in the 2020, in, in the beginning of the pandemic time. But this graphic is here to show you there is a cycle of vampire bat rabies that actually it's about time. Time is the dimension that works a lot here. Well, uh, when you are bitten by a dog, you recognize the divide and you go to get medical attention, it's just accessible. And then we have another, a lot of the issues mentioned this morning. But when you are bitten by a vampire bat, and many times there is not a problem, nothing happened, but, and then you have cattle. If there's rabies, cattle dies first, it's a month after, a month after that, there is no more cattle to feed. Uh, so vampire have to start to buy people, and then one month later you might have rabies in humans. And this delays in a very far remote area in many of the population of the Amazon makes it so difficult to control to to get attention to these people and wonder who dies first, children. And this is one of the key issues that we, we saw also in pictures in Africa how children are the main victims in this drama of rabies that is not ending yet. So here is the same thing. We have children dying first, and then when we get intervention that came very late, uh, we can say adults. But at the, at the time, regularly, 10, 20 children already die. So this is happening in outbreaks. It's not an isolated case that we can see one case in Bolivia, one case in Venezuela, but then we have here a cluster of cases at the same time. So this is very horrific situation. And it's, I would, I would say it's tolerable. It's still happening, but there are some interventions. Just some pictures to show a little the context of the life. So we say they are poor, they are, oh, they don't have resources to do. It's not all that. It's the ecology of the system. So this, this is a, an area that gets flooded, or the Amazon can and get half of the year is underwater and the other half of the year is not much underwater. You can see some picture here and then you have these houses that uh, don't have any services because they are far away. So ha houses allow the entry of bats and other animals. And the, the people live in these conditions and nothing has changed for some time, long time. Some picture of a real case of rabies. I will have the chance to see how they a population try to protect, they use mosquito nets, usually broken, old, and expensive to get them, but they try, but they don't get it. So this, this it was a 15-year-old boy that died from rabies, and you can see the small openings in the house that allow the entry of bats at night. Uh, West Peru did this uh, massive pre-exposure vaccination. There was the first in the world that vaccinated all the population, no matter what. So then. If you are beaten, you can survive. And what's very important impact, because you can see people vaccinated didn't die more, uh, anymore. So I don't have a uh, middle picture here, but that's only numbers. But when this vaccination happened, the outbreaks stopped. So then the impact on the general statistics from the Pan American Health Organization reducing 80% in one year. So it was so important impact then the logistics to bring uh, vaccines to far, far away in the Amazon are so important. So we need to classify the areas, the risk, and start to do a problem. Peru is in an ongoing program. They didn't finish the high risk areas yet, but 
the intervention allowed to save life and to reduce the outbreaks allowed. Uh, but uh, before going to other topics, you need to keep vaccinating the children that are getting born. And also you need to vaccinate people colonizing the Amazon. You know, there is a lot of narco-traffic, illegal uh, deforestation and illegal mining. A lot of stuff going on in this area of the world and these people need to be vaccinated. So there are no uh, <laughs> real full education for that. So far we intervene the people, but my point here, and you feel at the end of the talk is what are we doing to stop bites? And this is a paper we published when we went to a place in the Amazon with no rabies cases. And we found that the people have antibodies against rabies. How this it happen? How can you have antibodies and you never have rabies and you never have a vaccine? Is this documentation the highest frequency of animal exposure among population ever reported? And I take the second to say, no place in the world have more interaction of people with animals as here. People is not looking for that. It is this vampire bats feeding on people every day, mainly on children. So this is something that is not paid enough attention. And when we discuss about COVID and or COVID fears about coming coronavirus from, ba from bats and going to the market or going to the people, and then we forgot that there, yeah, there is a place that is incubating probably new pandemics in the future where people is bitten every day by these animals that have a lot of other uh, bacteria and viruses that might create new epidemics. So we need to pay a little more attention and that's the idea. So who are at risk? We have this uh, map just to show that the nine countries that are in the, um, Amazon basin. So you can see not all the whole countries are in the in the, in the Amazon, it's only parts of each country. But you can see this in this map that there are very dispersed populations. So you see the yellow uh, there where the, the cities are with more people concentrated. But in the Amazon basin, because it's so difficult to live there, you have a very dispersed population, only major cities in the main ports on the Amazon River, <clears throat> very well known cities. And then all the populations, mostly indigenous people, natives living there with the territories. They are not living, they are nomadic sometimes. They have to register the, now they are little by little being recognized on the possession of this land. So they're not gonna go anywhere, they're gonna stay. Uh, how many people is there? 25 million, okay. Uh, how many people are at risk because they are not close to healthcare? About 8 million. So, okay, it's only a million for so many people living in the world in Latin America. So then why we care? So this, this is my point. So these people is living in one place when they have no access to vaccine, no access to medical attention when they're beaten, and also no real knowledge or understanding that these vampires biting every day, they might not have a, the virus today, but they might have it because it's very well, very well documented how are the waves of the spreading of the virus and among vampire bat colonies. And when they have the virus, then we have this cluster of deaths. And communications are poor. Uh, navigation is the only way to move around in these areas. And they're far away. You can see all the children in this house in an elevated platform. Just remember that this elevated platform is not because it looks beautiful. They have nicer view. It's because the half of the year they are underwater. So underwater plus many other exposure for their health, but that's the way the life is going on there. So this is a human rights issue. I already said children die. So this is a situation where somebody has to die. So the government get aware there is an outbreak and send some help. So why somebody has to die? So that's not right. So that's one of the main problems with this human rabies outbreak in the Amazon. I already mentioned, this is a place where people are beating every day or anybody wants to more, do more research on that, please go. There's a lot to learn for that and maybe find new solutions. So I <clears throat> already mentioned that there is a, some kind of prediction. The next pandemic can came from the Amazon. Well, I have to say, I totally agree with that. And this is one of the worst scenarios for health disparities. Uh, people might say, oh, they want to live there, but this is a cultural thing, as I mentioned in the previous talk. So can you take these people to go and live somewhere 
you know, there is a big drama about uh, <coughs> some colonizers go and kill the natives just to take all the ownership of the land. So this is another situation that's complicating the access to these places, also foster the distrust of the populations with the government agencies, especially Ministry of Health. So this is a very, very complicated situation that we need to approach when we want to work with this population. Uh, well, we talk a lot about One Health, we we'll talk a lot about the one, the United Nations goals of the millennium, health for everybody. Okay, please, I challenge you to take some visit here and see if you can keep and suggest something to implement this in this difficult environment. We need to talk about emerging reservoirs. This is, as you can see in this picture, uh, Kinkaju, they call locally in Peru, Chosna, and this is very close to the border, Bolivia and Brazil. And there are uh, new indications that this might be a new reservoir that the rabies virus has been adapted. So there were kind of uh, uh, cases of bites related to these animals, but this is a wild animal. But what's going on behind this animal is, is it's a pet. And I found out investigating why this frequent exposure that's happening now, this is very wild animal. It's not because they eat it, it's because there is a market for this and there is an exportation of this animal from Peru to the United States and other countries as a pet. Nobody knows that about here. And this is about the time to deal with some connection with the trade, importation, veterinary, what's going on. We need a better discussion of this market of pets, the, the lifestyle we are in, so like exotic pets, and then we have these people getting exposed, and also they use as a pet in those areas. So this is the an emerging situation in Peru, and I'm trying to keep an eye. No data on bites, no data on trade, no data on anything, and we need to see if this is one of the new things that will be after zero by thirty. We need to take care of this wildlife too. Okay. And other talks I explained, okay, why we have so many solutions now, we don't have to prevent vaccination, why do we have human cases? And I, I listed some conditions, okay, we don't detect it, we don't have enough resources to give PEP, uh, post possible post exposure prophylaxis, and many other issues. Well, all of these issues are present in the Amazon basin, and of course, all of them won't be solved any soon. For a long time. Um, so then what can we do? Can we try anything better than buy care after the fact? Mm -hmm. My point is, yes, we can try to think how to stop the buy. We need to stop people to being beaten. Is this possible? Education it was our answer for a long time. Maybe we need to think with better technology, new technology, <clears throat> some other solutions. It is the time to discuss that. Uh, all governments, the programs, everything is oriented to the pathogen, but not to the exposure. Uh, we have the exposure that the bite, dog bites, bat bites, shosna bite, uh, other animal bites. The only not, uh, it's not only about rabies. We are discovering more and more that there are many other pathogens that can be transmissible through the bites. And we don't have enough surveillance to understand if they are really happening in some transmission of zoonotic diseases. So there is another, uh, a lot of space for research and a lot of space to team up with other researchers or other groups just to make policies thinking on stopping the bite or pe having people better protected to bite. Uh, then uh, I mentioned that uh, this. Um, other pathogens, I will mention by name, Bartonellas, Trypanosoma cruzi, the pathogen from Chagas disease. Uh, by the way, Chagas disease in Peru and other countries recognized in areas specific, but nobody is looking for that in the Amazon, but we found evidence in saliva and bad bats in the Amazon uh, with Trypanosoma cruzi that can produce Chagas. So that's very important to take a look, maybe an emerging or emerging disease on the on the way. Uh, coronaviruses, I need to comment. There is some research uh, talking about reverse zoonosis. What do you mean? People getting sick and passing 
uh, the pathogens to the animal. So it was very, a lot of publicity that uh, a pet dog, a pet cat got uh, coronavirus called COVID, but uh, what happened with vampire bite? But nobody really knows very well, but they tested on that and they found that vampire bats are perfectly viable to get coronaviruses and expand in a different way this zoonosis in a reverse way and expand it to other places. So we need to look more into that. And then we have rabies and other team of a plethora of diseases that can, we can stop working with uh, preventing bad. Finally, we need to think geography, it's a limitation. How long this is going to be for, for a long time, maybe new solutions can have better uh, transportation. I don't see that for the Amazon so far. Uh, social issues, we cannot change uh, cultural indifference. The racism is a discussion that has to happen in each government, in each of these nine countries, the Amazon, uh, because the, the question of a small population versus there is a sector of a population being exposed that is kind of abandoned, need to be approached. Of course, there is a lot of signs that we need to uh, show to more people as we need better communicators, better translation of signs into messages to educate people, also to educate government and people who make decisions for policies and innovation and technology. This is a call for everybody to think there is anything we can do to stop bites in any way that it's urgently needed. Maybe we can produce something, maybe a new market for, for patents or whatever. Uh, maybe remember telephone, cell telephone changed the world globally. Everybody has one anywhere. Doesn't matter how poor is the country. So you have to think outside the box and say we need to find something that can interfere with bites in any way, at least with vampires. Um, well, zero by 30 is going to be achievable with all difficulties. And after that, we need to deal with wildlife rabies. And thank you for your attention. I'm happy to share more information. And my emails are there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Requenco, for that enlightening talk. I'm curious, based on your experience, um, is there any relevance as part of this multi-pronged strategy, for example, to introduce PrEP into childhood vaccination for Amazonia? Yes, this is an interesting discussion. When Peru started this pre-exposure massive vaccination, they say, okay, what's going to happen with a cohort of children coming up every year? So they included in the national uh, schedule for uh, children, only in the high-risk areas. So uh, there are several vaccines were included, like hepatitis. Uh, at the beginning, it was only children in the Amazon, and they expanded to everybody in the population right now. So there is a potential for that. And then we need to think carefully uh, because uh, there is a study that uh, already explained that it is not cost effective to have a rabies vaccination for the whole population. So the discrimination of where are high risk areas and which areas are accessible, it's important and as, as important as it is, it's not done. So this is something that to work with each country, you need to determine where are your areas that have this criteria, access, high risk, frequency of bites, and uh, in potential for increase of bias because tourists or illegal trading or whatever. So we need to discuss that and have areas and kind of monitor and have this vaccination for people and for children. So then we can schedule that. So yes, there is a, a inclusion, but what is not complete is that many areas that may be uh, uh, of low risk are actually at high risk. So, so Thank you. yes, there is a plan.